All right, so um, it's normal that it's not quite as smooth as you might think uh, to set ourselves up here. That's why we have these several days in the beginning where we set up our development environment and we do the time to figure all of this out because we're taking a project that we started elsewhere. We started it in Notepad++ and then we migrated it over here. So you could say, ideally, it might be useful to start your project automatically day one in Visual Studio. But I wanted to do it this way to show that you can start with any web project that you've ever done ever and basically integrate it into a Visual Studio code of a project. Sometimes there's a little rough around the edges and you have to figure things out, but it does work. Now in the future, when you make your apps in the future, I would recommend start with Visual Studio right away. Uh, create your Visual Studio file and start writing your code right away in Visual Studio. But I think seeing it this way is also valuable. Now, uh, what happens here is, uh, just to show you here, I'm going to uh, run this in the simulator. If I run it on my real device, you won't be able to see very much. Obviously, it's on my device. But if I run this on uh, the, the browser, OK, the project loaded up, great. If you're also taking a, a, a peek back here in Visual Studio, let me run that one more time. If, you, if you're simulating it and you're also looking in Visual Studio's output, you might notice something. So it looks like it loads up here fine, but then if you look in Visual Studio in your JavaScript output panel, some things pop up, and especially the ones that say failed to load and such. Those are the scary ones, of course. Now this one says failed to load resource fav icon. I already mentioned that one before. You can ignore the one that says it couldn't load the fav icon. Uh, we don't have a fav icon in our project. This is a web icon that shows in the web browser, but we're not in a web browser anymore. You can ignore that. What you might see, which is more important, is this one here, fail to load resource, ajax loader.gif. So this is a little simple spinning uh, circle that loads up while you might move from screen to screen. It says it can't find the ajax loader. This is saying here, if you hover over, well, we're looking inside your CSS folder, in your images folder, and we can't find that file in the, in the CSS folder images Ajax. OK, well, there's a couple of ways to fix this. Because it's looking for it in a place, in a slightly different place. If you notice, we've got our Ajax loader GIF inside of images folder. Um, but the problem is that this CSS file is looking for this GIF file right there. And there's two ways to fix it. Either we put the GIF in the same place that the CSS file expects it, or we rewrite the CSS a little bit to point to where it currently is. Both will work fine. Both are One might be easier than the other. It might be easier uh, to put the file where it expects it instead of changing the code. Because if you haven't peeked inside of that CSS file, that's what that file is. It's just a huge line and you can't read anything inside of it. Technically, you could do a control find and find where it says Ajax, and maybe you can change the code. It's on line three. Well, everything's on line three. <laughs> <laughs> so we can either fix it by editing the CSS and changing our path. You have to find you have to do find, you're not gonna find it elsewhere. Or I think the way I'll try it is I'm gonna put the Ajax loader where it expects it, which is inside of an images folder where the CSS file is at. So that means in the CSS folder I need a new images folder. And in that images folder, I need the Ajax loader in the images folder in the CSS folder. That's the confusion. So it's either editing the code or putting the file where it expects. I'm going to do it in the way of putting, it, putting the file where it expects, like this. In your CSS folder, right click it, select uh, new or add a folder. So you need to right-click the CSS file to tell it we want a new folder. We want to add a new folder in the CSS folder. That's going to pop up, and we will call this images. 
Yeah. New folder. New folder. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so um, this Ajax file and these images files here too, it might not give us the error at the moment, but I would uh, I would move these three files into that images folder in the CSS folder. Because the jQuery CSS file expects its supporting files to be in an images folder, but not this images folder because that's on a different level of the structure. So I would copy, or I would move actually the icons ping, icon SVG, and Ajax loader into the images folder <coughs> in the CSS folder. Now the CSS file will expect it and find it there. Question? Can we just took in the current images folder and just move it up? <laughs> uh, possibly that might have worked as well, but um, then when we actually start to add more images, that might be a problem. Now, if you're using your project, for example, and you use the picture of Superman, and you put it in the images folder, but then you move that images folder into a different location than when the index file expected. Now you've got another problem because here this index file is expecting that Superman picture in the images folder, which you move to the CSS folder. So it's if you if you mind that and pay attention to it, yeah, that's no problem. It's sort of either or. Are we going to confuse the CSS file or are we going to confuse the index HTML file? And once we know what's going on, we can fix either or. So now, if I run this again, you can do save all just to confirm. Now when I run it again, I, I shouldn't get that error. Just remember that this does not automatically clean itself out. Very annoying. So I have to clean it out and then run it. And there we go. So it's not complaining about the Ajax loader anymore. It's still me me mentioning the fav icon, which I'm going to ignore. And it's popping up code about no user logged in. Good. It's, it's recognizing all the code and hard work that we did last month about is the user logged in? Does it exist or not? So um, I'm running this. I'm going to create an account. I'm logged in. You can keep kind of testing it, rerunning it. If you noticed here, I created an account. I logged in. I restarted the whole project. It signed me in automatically. It should have taken me directly to home. Remember, one of the last things we did last month was I wanted to remember me, and I wanted to auto-log me in, which it is doing. So you should be you should notice that that it is auto logging you in. I'm going to try it on my regular device here just to fully test it. And oftentimes it's a little slower to run on a real device. So that's why I often test it first on a on the virtual device. Oh, and then stuff like that happens. So okay, I'll just keep testing it on my virtual device.
So uh, our workflow, uh, we're either going to be looking at the uh, console output built into Visual Studio. You're also able to F12 inside of Chrome and see uh, see output there. So it's saying Cordova is ready. User is logged in. So it did automatically take me to the welcome screen. Uh, that wasn't working last month. Like I like I said, for some weird quirk, last month it wouldn't auto log you in, even though it could detect that you were logged in. Now it should automatically log you in if you did create an account. And then this right here looks looks good. User is logged in. Cordova is ready. And if you have your device all set up, remember uh, you can you can also use Chrome to um, to sort of debug the device as well. If you recall, you can uh, go to the de customized dev tools, more tools, uh, remote devices. So once you've got this project running in a real device, you can go to Chrome, F12, and then options there, more tools and remote devices. So for myself, you saw a moment ago, I tried to run it on my device. It popped up with a big old error message. I just unplugged it, switched back to simulate device, then replugged it in and switched back to real device. Sometimes you just have to do the same thing three times, and then it behaves. I don't know. So it did it. OK, it's running on my real device. Uh, I'm going to use Google Chrome just to see what my device is doing. Let me just open Chrome, F12. Go to your options, more tools. And if your device is compatible, you can go to remote devices. My device shows up right there. I can inspect. I notice for some of you, when you try to inspect your device here, you would click and nothing would happen. And sometimes that's also because, for whatever reason, you, ha you have to stop debugging in Visual Studio first. It seems that on mine, it's it's running, it's attached to Visual Studio, and on mine, it still looks like I can ex inspect. For some of you, if you click Inspect and nothing happens, you want to stop Visual Studio, and then try to do that debug. In my case, OK, here it is. So brand new run. I got my output right there. I'm going to sign up. Again, I can on my particular one, I can control it. I'm not using my mental powers. I am clicking on the keyboard and stuff here. And then putting in something there. Oops. Here. Clicking join. So it says log in. Looks kind of funny there. And then OK. You need to sign in. Now you may notice that that back button looks a little weird. I'll address that in just a moment. But here I am logging in on my real device. Logged in. Uh, and I get my output right there. So I can go to the Save Comic screen, View Comic screen. Back to home. So I'm navigating in through the screen here. Uh, I can press back on my device. It takes me back. So cool, I'm navigating around. I'm pressing back and such. Uh, pressing the buttons, press back. Uh, whoops, I pressed back too far. And now it took me back to log in. I don't want that. I don't want the ability to accidentally log myself out of the, out of the app by pressing back. So what we're going to do is we're going to capture the instance when someone presses back 
and stop that. I only want the person to navigate in my app by the buttons that I've allowed. I don't want them to accidentally press back and log out. So we're going to do that. The way we do that is via JavaScript. So I'm going to go back to Visual Studio. Let's go back. Let's go to our index.js file, line 10. So all of this stuff was here beforehand. We've got our function, use strict, document, event listener, device ready, and then on device. So we put in those 200 lines of code inside of our on device ready. All of the code that we worked on last month must be inside of this on device ready. And future code that we work on must be inside of on device ready, which at the moment goes all the way down to line 195 or so. So when we add new code, it's, it's got to be inside of on device ready. I, I said before that there is, uh, we've got the whole document object, the whole app, basically. Add event listener, we're waiting for an event. We're waiting for the event of device ready. Uh, as soon as device ready fires, as soon as it happens, then we run the on device ready function, and then basically our app starts. Then we can uh, do other stuff. One of the things I want to do here is I want to prevent the back button from working. I don't want the back button to accidentally log people out. I want them to go to the options screen and actually log out. So we have here document event add event listener pause and resume. And we have a way to pay attention to if someone presses the back button. So let's add a new line right after that and say capture the event of back button press to prevent it from logging people out. We can capture the event of pause and resume. We can pay attention to when the app is paused and when the app resumes, and then run a function. We run a function of on pause or on resume. We have something very similar then for the back button. Next line, we're going to say document. And remember, you can use the shortcuts here, tab, dot add, tab. So that would get used to using that tab button for it to auto type for you so you don't make a mistake. Open parentheses. Look at this. It says, well, we've got all of these possible event listeners. Activate, drag over, load, start, drop, mouse down, all of these ones that you never thought of. Play, when you click a play button, etc. So we've got all of these possibilities of events in this big old pop up here. Well, the one we want in quotes is back button. It's actually not one of the built-in ones. This is specific to Cordova. These that pop up are like the basic default built-in JavaScript ones. Back button is not a basic built-in JavaScript event. It's a Cordova uh, event that we can listen for. So this is when you can press escape to ignore the suggestion. Now, uh, the original template was using single quotes. Single quotes. I'm using double quotes. Either or works just fine. It doesn't matter which kind of quote you use. We've used the double quotes all along, and you can continue to do so. Or you can use the single quotes if you want that to look the same as before. But we use double quotes everywhere else. If you're like me and a perfectionist sometimes, well, obviously the answer is to go back and fix those other ones to also be double quotes. You don't have to do that. Unless you've got mad typing skills like me and you're done already. That's okay. So, you don't have to do that. But we've got here um, back button. Um, Okay, we're waiting for someone to press the back button. We're then going to run some kind of function to stop the back button from actually working. 
Uh, we'll be very creative and we'll call this on. Oh, well, actually, we have to do it this way. Function, open close parentheses, open close curly brace. We're going to run a function after the back button is pressed. We're going to invent our own function to wait for it to be run when back button event is emitted. Um, there is going to be an event that happens. So uh, we're going to use the currently fired event um, in part in, inside of this function. And the one we're going to call here is on back key down. Open close parentheses, semicolon. This is where it's going to complain about missing semicolon. Um, because as we saw before, that's technically its own line event. And at the very end of the line, semicolon. That semicolon ends our statement of this event listener. And this semicolon ends our command of this command right here. Run this command after a back button, run a function, end of statement there, end of statement there. Yes, it looks a little odd, but that's the right way. Because like I said, you can sort of think about it this way, that it's separated into multiple lines. And now it's obvious that that should have an ending semicolon there. Yes. Is the back button uh, a kind of click event? It's a kind of a click event. It's a special one because it comes from a physical back button on the device. But what? It could be attached event or it could be a attached what? Attached event or it could be it it could be um, I have to check exactly which one this is here, but yes, it's an event that happens on certain devices because iPhones don't have this. iPhones don't have the back button. Android devices do. So if you're on an, if you're on an iPhone, it's just going to ignore it. There's no back button to press, so it'll just ignore it. But on an Android device, there's a back button, and that's what I'm capturing when I press it. All right, so um, this uh, on pause here and this on resume are functions that were defined in the document to deal with when the app is paused, meaning that I've exited the app, the app got paused, and then resume happens when I resume the app. So when I go back to the app right here, the resume event happened, and it goes back. So we need to write this function on back key down and if you go all the way to the end of your code all the way to the end we've already got like a little group there where we've got on pause on resume now we need to create the one we just set up before the end of the final immediately invoked function expression so before your very last line you need to make a new line there you're writing a function on back key down parentheses curly braces you can note that this is your end of on back key down we're passing in the event argument some event happened the event is pressing back on the keyboard or back on the on the device we had some console output up on the previous functions we'll add some here as well console log let's say um, trying to press the back button What actually prevents that is going to be very familiar. 
when we um, when we had the login system, we had a form. We had a form that was asking for email and password. We pressed submit, and by default, classic forms in HTML were on a web server, and the screen would refresh. Remember this, what I'm getting at? We had to make that form behave a different way. We prevented the default behavior of that form. Well, here there's a default behavior to pressing back on the device. So we're doing the same thing here. There's an event which we, which, which we will then say dot prevent default. The default behavior of pressing back on the device is to take you back one screen. I no longer want that. I want people to navigate my app by pressing the buttons in the device. So that's exactly what we've used before about preventing the default behavior of a form. In this case, it's the default behavior of the back button. So now do save all, and you'll see the best result of this on a real device. I'm not exactly sure if it will really prevent it on the web browser. You can try it. Uh, but I'm going to run this on a real device. I'm going to try to use that back button. I'm going to keep an eye out on the console. And it should tell me, you're trying to press back. And it should not let you go back. So let's see here. My thing loaded up. I'm going to try to press back. Pressing back, trying to press back button. I'm pressing back, but it's not logging out. It's still in the same place. That's good. I try to go to View Comics. I try to press back. Doesn't go back. Good. I don't want that back button to, to take me back. I want to let the person, or make the person, navigate my app through the buttons that I've allowed. That back button could have them log out automatic or accidentally. Let me check it in the simulator just to get this other point of view. Yeah, in the simulator here, um, it's not really going to work. If you try to press back, it will go back. It's not capturing that kind of back button. That's I expected it, so that's OK. So this is one of the things that will definitely work on a real device. So as long as you didn't get any error and you're testing it on a virtual device, you probably did it right. This is the one that you have to really test on a real device. Yes? OK, we'll be there one moment. Be there one moment. Okay. When I hit go, it takes me back to the home screen. Does it happen as well? Okay. It will work right now. OK, I'll check you in one moment. But here's what, uh, from now on, as we're starting to get these errors, here's how I would start to troubleshoot this. Make sure that nothing is telling you anything is wrong in the error list, number one. And then when you try to run it on your device or virtual device, uh, check F12 in the browser. Check if any errors are happening there. That's what I would be doing in just a moment. But now we're going to need to look at our error console much more to see if anything is going on. It will be there one moment. Okay, uh, while we're here, because I'm going to forget this very easily, let's do something slightly different before I forget. Um, did you notice that when your uh, app is running, uh, like the back button on the top seems to be popping out of the header? The back button's too big. Let's fix that before I forget. So that's happening inside your CSS file, index.css. Go ahead and open up index.css.
in the CSS file, we had the we, we left some uh, some code here um, as a starting point. And the problem is line 19. It's saying here your fonts are going to be 12 points. Uh, so that might be too big, too small, or, or, or whatever. So you can either play around with that size a little bit uh, to find the right size, or for the moment you can deactivate that line. Oops. You can deactivate that line by putting a comment around it. And for the moment, I think that'll be good enough to fix that. You're, right now, the, the, in general, I think the fonts are too small, in general. That's because we're seeing 12 pixels and not points, pixels. I think everything's a little too small. If we don't set a size, it will use the default size of the device, which often looks all right. Another way to do this is instead of having a pixel value, you could have a percentage value, 100%. Oftentimes, 105% is a little more readable. So instead of using pixel values, which often don't look that great on devices because one device claims 12 pixels is this big and another device claims it's this big, so you never quite get the right size. But here using percentages, that often works a little better. Start with the basic default size of whatever the device thinks is good and readable and just make it a little bit larger. As you know, I don't know about you, but you know, these these phones keep getting bigger and bigger, but the text keeps getting smaller and smaller. So a little bit larger there. Now you can save, do save all, run it again, and that back button shouldn't be weird anymore. And then general, the, the font in the whole app should look a little nicer, a little larger, a little more readable. So running it in the simulator, I think that looks good. The text is a little larger, good. And then running it on my real device. So using simulators works nice to quickly see something, but it's always better to try on real devices. That's why we've got the devices in our room here. Um, as I said before, this one, I bought it a few years ago. It was prepaid. It was $45. It works just fine. It's on Verizon. I don't have Verizon. I have AT&T. I walked into Best Buy. I went to the department where all of the prepaid stuff is. I just got one, whatever, $49, Motorola, and this works fine as my testing device. Once in a while, just to see how it all works, I then pop in my real phone and then test it on that. So it's always good to get different opinions, different devices, tablets, small phones, big phones. Because simulators are OK, but they don't let you do everything, such as you know, a moment ago when I, when I saw the back button wasn't working in the, in the simulator. And now when I actually go look at the screens here, yep, the back button is no, is no longer popping out all weird because the font of 12 pixels wasn't the right size, but with a percentage size, I think that's a little better. So on line 20 in your CSS, I put 105% and that works pretty well.